Author John Kuiper Liberty presents Gospel Theology, God's Good News for Everything, published by Westbow Press, Bloomington, Indiana, 2021, used with permission. Appendix A. They bear witness about me, seeing Jesus in the Old Testament. The Bible contains 66 books written over the course of hundreds of years. Although it is commonly accepted that the entirety of the Bible is relevant for Christians, in practice, the Old Testament is often misunderstood and even completely neglected. Since Jesus is the central figure of Christianity, and the New Testament contains the records of his life, it is assumed that the Old Testament has little to say about him apart from a few scattered prophecies. But is this the case? Is the Son of God largely absent from the Old Testament? Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for their incorrect reading of the Old Testament and their refusal to come to him because of it. He said, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. John 5, 39-40 He and his apostles knew that the Bible tells one unified story centered on him and his work. This story is linked together by the covenants God made with man. God's plan of redemption becomes increasingly clear throughout the Bible's progressive revelation. When one's method of interpreting the Bible, hermeneutic, is derived from the scriptures, the Son of God is rightly seen all over the Old Testament. The Covenantal Unity of the Bible The Bible is split into the Old Testament and New Testament, but this division does not mean that the Bible is two separate stories. Jesus and the New Testament writers assume that the events of their time are a continuation of what began in the Old Testament. After his resurrection from the dead, Jesus appeared to two disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. Jesus said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Luke 24, 25 through 27. By calling them foolish ones, Jesus assumed that they should have not been surprised by the gospel events because this is what the Old Testament was all about. Paul knew that the Bible contains one unified story, and he told Timothy that the Old Testament scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 3:15. The gospel of first importance is according to the Old Testament scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 3-5. But the fact that the Bible is one unified story is not merely assumed from a few isolated passages of the New Testament. Any reader of the New Testament who is familiar with the Old Testament will see that the New Testament authors filled the pages of their narratives, epistles, and apocalyptic writings with quotations and allusions to the Old Testament. If they were starting a new religion from scratch or taking an unforeseen detour from the Old Testament, one wonders why they consistently, in every book of the New Testament, sought to prove their teaching from what God had already revealed. For example, Craig L. Blomberg says, The Hebrew Scriptures, or Christian Old Testament, permeate Matthew's Gospel. Approximately 55 references prove close enough in wording for commentators typically to label them quotations. In addition to these explicit quotations, numerous allusions and echoes of Scripture may be discerned in every part of this Gospel. Furthermore, the Gospel of Luke has about 439 Old Testament allusions. Romans contains around 60 Old Testament citations and... No other book of the New Testament is as permeated by the Old Testament as is Revelation. The story starts at the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis 1. Luke provides a genealogy of Jesus in Luke 3, 23-38 that traces him all the way back to Adam in the Garden of Eden. John opens his gospel with an allusion to Genesis 1, 1, saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John 1, 1. When Jesus opened the minds of the disciples to understand the scriptures, he showed them that everything in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms was about him, Luke 24, 44 through 45. Vern Poitras explains, The Old Testament as a whole, through its promises, its symbols, and its pictures of salvation, looks forward to the actual accomplishment of salvation that took place once for all in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
The evidence for the unity of the Bible is overwhelming and has led Edmund Clowney to say, The Bible is the greatest storybook, not just because it is full of wonderful stories, but because it tells one great story, the story of Jesus. All of the Old Testament promises of God are fulfilled in Christ, 2 Corinthians 1.20. God's plan since the beginning was to unite all things in Jesus in the fullness of time, Ephesians 1, 9-10. But what is the link that God used to connect this one story about Christ? The answer is found in the Bible's covenants. A covenant usually refers to an agreement between a superior and an inferior, between a lord and a servant. Numerous covenants are mentioned throughout the Bible, either implicitly or explicitly. How these covenants fit together is one of the most important questions of theology. The first covenant God made with man was in the Garden of Eden. God told Adam to work and to keep the garden, Genesis 2.15. God allowed Adam to eat from any tree except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If he ate from that tree, he would surely die, Genesis 2.16. If he did not, he would continue to enjoy the blessings of living in the presence of God. Theologians have called this covenant the covenant of works because the people's right standing before God was based on their obedience to his commands, Galatians 3.10. Immediately following the breaking of the covenant of works is the first promise of a new covenant, a new way of God relating to his people that he would formally establish later in history as the new covenant. God first announced this promise of Christ and his grace in his curse of the serpent, saying, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Genesis 3.15 Theologians have referred to this promised covenant as the covenant of grace, since it involves God doing the work on behalf of his people, requiring of them only faith in him and his promise. Jeremiah 31.31-34 the promise of the covenant of grace and the coming seed slash offspring, Jesus Christ, is what links the story of the Bible together. After the events in the Garden of Eden, God made further covenants with man which give increasing detail as to how this seed would accomplish redemption. In the Noahic covenant, God promised that he would preserve the world for the seed to come and do his saving work, Genesis 9, 8-18. In the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12, 1-3, in 15, 1-20, God promised to bless the whole world through the coming seed, and he declared that true righteousness comes by faith, Genesis 15, 6. In the Mosaic Covenant, God republished the covenant of works to lead his people to the seed who would come and keep the covenant of works for them, Galatians 3, 19-24. Furthermore, he established formal worship, the sacrificial system, and ceremonial law that through types and shadows point to the seed, Colossians 2.17. In the Davidic covenant, God promised that the seed would be the eternal king, ruling over his people in righteousness and justice and establishing peace on earth for all time, 2 Samuel 7, 1-17. From Seed to Substance, Progressive Revelation the nature of the Old Testament and the covenants described above demonstrate that it was not God's desire to reveal everything about Jesus Christ and his gospel immediately after the fall. God's revealing of gospel truths piece by piece is what theologians have called progressive revelation. Vern Poitras explains, God caused the Bible to be written over a period of more than a thousand years. As Lord of history and Lord of revelation, he spoke at many times and in many ways through the prophets, Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. God did not say everything at once. The earlier communications take into account the limitations and the understanding of people at earlier times. The later communications build on the earlier. What is implicit in the earlier often becomes explicit in the later. The climax to this process of revelation comes in Christ. In these last days he has spoken to us by his Son whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world, Hebrews 1-2. Taken together, these communications from God have a marvelous unity centered on the divine purpose of redemption and recreation. Although God's revelation is progressive, it is essential to note that God's people in the Old Testament did not simply have a general faith in God. As David Murray says, Whenever we read of souls being converted in the Old Testament, it is to the Messiah they were turned, not to God in general, but to Christ in particular, 
They knew Christ in the seed form which had been revealed to them at that time. Hebrews 11.26 says Moses considered the reproach of Christ. In John 8, 56 through 58, Jesus says that Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. John says that Isaiah saw Jesus' glory, John 12, 41. Peter says the prophet spoke specifically of the sufferings of Christ, 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. Moreover, Paul says in Galatians 3, 8, In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. Ian Duguid comments, The gospel of the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow was clear to Old Testament readers from the earliest days, even if only in outline and sometimes obscure form. This is crucial to affirm, since the Old Testament saints were saved by faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ just as we are, and not by some other method of salvation. In order to maintain that notion, it is necessary to affirm, as Paul does, that the gospel message was genuinely visible to the eyes of faith in the Old Testament long before its revelation and fullness in the coming of Christ. The Old Testament saints knew Christ and saw the gospel as an acorn, and the budding oak tree became clearer and clearer until its full revelation in the events of the New Testament. While Adam and Eve knew Christ only as the seed of the woman that would crush the head of the serpent, Genesis 3.15, Moses and those with him knew Christ as the one who the Lord would raise up to be a great prophet, Deuteronomy 18.15-22. God revealed to his people in the time of King David that Christ would have a throne forever, 1 Chronicles 17.12, and would even be David's Lord, Psalm 110.1, and a great priest, Psalm 110.4. Those in the time of Isaiah had greater clarity into the Christ being divine, Isaiah 9.6, the one who would suffer a substitutionary atonement on behalf of his people, Isaiah 53, and whose rule and good law would increase and spread over the whole earth, Isaiah 9.7. Wearing the right glasses, utilizing biblical hermeneutics. The reason why many Christians miss these important truths about Christ in the Old Testament is because they have been taught an unbiblical method of interpreting the Old Testament, hermeneutics. Evangelical literalists, according to Graham Goldsworthy, claim to take the promises concerning the restoration of Israel, Jerusalem, and the temple at their face value. They believe that a text cannot mean what the human author of the text never understood it to mean. For this reason, they do not interpret the Old Testament in a Christ-centered manner because they do not believe the Old Testament references Christ outside of several scattered prophecies. But where should Bible readers get their hermeneutic? There is no other option but from God himself speaking through the Bible, 2 Timothy 3, 15-17. Jesus prayed, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. McCartney and Clayton explain, the Bible's interpretation of itself should indicate to us the nature of our interpretation. That is, our hermeneutic should have as its standard the hermeneutic of the biblical writers, particularly the New Testament writers as they interpret the Old Testament. Biblical interpretation that follows the lead of the New Testament should understand the texts of the Bible in their redemptive historical setting, should relate them to the ultimate biblical goal of fulfillment in Christ, and should apply them to God's people. The New Testament writer's use of the Old Testament should also provide some indications of what our method should be. The Old Testament writers did not have exhaustive knowledge of everything they wrote, but readers must not forget that the Old Testament is ultimately authored by God himself, 2 Peter 1, 19-21. For this reason, the Bible must be read in light of its full revelation, so the true meaning of texts are not missed and replaced with surface-level readings. The error of failing to read the Bible backwards is exemplified when considering typology. A type is a copy that bears resemblance to the original. For example, Matthew identifies Israel as a type of Christ when he quotes Hosea 11.1, 1, Out of Egypt I called my son, in Matthew 2.15, and says it is fulfilled in Jesus when in the immediate context, Hosea is referring to the nation of Israel. Do Christian Bible interpreters have the liberty to find Christ in Old Testament types in the same way the apostles did? Some say no, since the apostles were inspired by God and ordinary Christians are not. But as Edmund Clowney says, 
That is a little like saying that you can find solutions to math problems only by looking in the back of the book, since you haven't a clue as to how to work the problems. To conclude that we can never see a type where the New Testament does not identify it is to confess hermeneutical bankruptcy. To be faithful to God's word, a pattern of interpreting the Bible must be derived from the Bible itself. Guidelines for Seeing Jesus in the Old Testament With this foundation in mind, the question can now be considered, where exactly is Jesus in the Old Testament? First, he is found in the many prophecies explicitly predicting his life events, like where he would be born, Micah 5.2, his virgin birth, Isaiah 7.14, and that he would be buried with the rich, Isaiah 53.9. Second, he is found as an actual person. These manifestations of Christ are referred to as Christophanies. No one can see God the Father, John 1.18, but God the Son is seen numerous times throughout the Old Testament, referred to both as a man, Genesis 18, and as the angel of the Lord, Genesis 16.7. He even receives worship, Joshua 5.14-15. Douglas Van Dorn comments, The angel of the Lord is called Yahweh, God, and I am, among other names that we normally associated in our minds only with God, the one being, or perhaps with the Father. Third, he is found in typology. James Hamilton Jr. explains, The typology introduced in the Old Testament works like literary foreshadowing, but it is more than a mere literary device. Types are not arbitrary correspondences invented by the biblical authors, but genuine accounts of what really took place. The biblical authors are drawing attention to people, events, and institutions where the divine author has caused actual resemblance. To examine biblical typology is to examine the orchestration of the sovereign God. The reader of the Bible must not only find types of Christ in the persons, events, and institutions that the New Testament explicitly identifies, as in Adam, Romans 5.14, God's firstborn son and nation of Israel, Exodus 4.22, the rock Moses struck, 1 Corinthians 10.4, the manna that came down from heaven, John 6.51, or the Passover, 1 Corinthians 5.7. As discussed above, the New Testament authors are providing a pattern by which Christ is to be found typologically in the Old Testament. Not just a few sacrifices, but the whole law, the temple, and all of ceremonial worship point to Jesus. Hebrews 8, 1 through 6. Furthermore, Timothy Keller rightly says, All the major figures and leaders of the scriptures point us to Christ, the ultimate leader who calls out and forms a people for God. All anointed leaders in the Bible, every prophet, priest, king, and judge who brings about salvation or deliverance or redemption of any kind or level are pointers to Christ in their strengths and even in their flaws. Even their flaws show that God works by grace and uses what the world sees as marginal and weak. Also, biblical themes of kingdom, covenant, justice, and judgment Righteousness and nakedness, and more, all point to Christ. Every deliverance event, the stories of the sacrifice of Isaac, Joseph in Egypt, the Exodus, David and Goliath, etc., is a gospel pattern, a grace event or storyline. You can move from the grace event to the work of Christ. As the wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 1.24, and the greater Solomon, Luke 11.31, Christ fulfills the wisdom books of the Old Testament, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Space fails to speak of the numerous other ways Christ is in the Old Testament. Abuses in interpretation can happen when a text is ripped out of its setting in the narrative of the Bible. But abuses must not be a reason to abandon the hermeneutic of the Bible in efforts at proper Christ-centered interpretation. As Luke Walker has said, if it is an error to go too far in seeing Christ in the Old Testament where he is not, it is a safer error than the modern one, which is nothing short of a Christless exposition of Scripture. We live in a day of Christless preaching. The lambs need more of him than ever. Christians glorify God and grow into maturity by beholding the glory of Christ, 2 Corinthians 3.18, in both the Old and New Testaments. Conclusion the Bible tells one unified story, linked together by the promise of the covenant of grace that is progressively revealed. Jesus and the New Testament writers knew that the Old Testament centered on him and his work. 
Although the Old Testament writers did not understand everything they wrote, God, the ultimate author of Scripture, was revealing Christ and his plan to redeem his creation as the story unfolded. Bible readers must utilize hermeneutics derived from the Scriptures themselves. When they do this, they will see Christ as he was intended to be seen in prophecy, Christophany, typology, and more.